Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly 90 minute deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Lisa. I'm a clinical psychologist and a college counselor. I am a parent of a boy in elementary school, a girl in middle school, and a girl in college. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHealthToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, the employment mismatch. A great article by Karen Fisher in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. And the question is from me this year. (laughs) Why should Tulane waitlist 12,000 students and not take a single one? Our interview is by Courtney Minden, the Vice President of Enrollment for Babson College. And it is on the new ways colleges recruit. It is an interview part one of three. And our college spotlight is the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And friends, I'll tell you, I come here and Dave comes here and Lisa come here here every week. We're really excited. We love what we do. Uh, but particularly today, I'm coming to you with a degree of ebullience because I think every one of our segments uh, today is just really, really exciting. So I'm not going to give you a lot of small talk. I'm going to dive right in because I can't wait to get to our article. And so we're going to start out, Dave, with our admissions tip. Yes. And the admissions tip is seriously consider visiting the career center when you visit colleges and ask them the tough questions. And if you want to know what tough questions to ask, little tease, go back and listen to my interview with Emily Griffin when I did an interview with her on the Career Center and asked her that question, what should be the tough questions? The tip is visit the Career Center or at least set up a meeting from home with the Career Center as part of your evaluation of the schools you're considering and ask them the tough questions. All right. The admissions tip. So here's the thing. Yeah. Dave is running on fumes over here a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I got to tell you, I'm in competition now. Why? Well, we're, with that? Lisa. We, we're co- <laughs> so let's see who can get out of the back of the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I threw a curveball at her with Wisconsin. This is the number one school. For CEOs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lisa, we're sharing the back of the classroom reward here. So let's see if okay. we can make it a single. <laughs> Keep being a smart aleck like that and I'll make it harder. Because I was I was gonna make it a little easier for Dave because he, he not only so Dave usually when Dave pulls an all-nighter, which he did, he worked graveyard shift last night. Normally we record right afterward, but he's went from the graveyard shift to a funeral. Someone Dave and I have known for 50 years. Yeah. And and now he should be sleeping to get ready for the graveyard shift again. So he may be running on fumes, but here he is being a good trooper. Here he is. I, I'm running on happy juice. So let's let's there you go. keep it going. Yes. So I'm going to test you out on this one. Admissions vernacular. Okay. Click rate. What is click rate? Oh, I know. This is easy. Click rate. This is you set when, yourself off when you no, say that. This is easy. This is when you're like on your computer and you see. Uh, an ad for a university or whatever, and you click on it. And if you click on it, uh, the unit, the, the website keeps track of how many people are clicking and that's their click rate. All right. I'm going to give that to you. <laughs> so, so here's the context and how it relates. So it is true. Click rate is a term that's not exclusively in admissions. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm at a, a webinar with a half a dozen admissions counselors. There was a counselor webinar and they're all Midwest schools. And I ask the question, I say, with all of this online virtual presentation, really easy for you guys to see who's engaged and who's not. Are there any ways in which you see yourself tracking demonstrated interest more now? And one of the admission directors speaks up and he said, it's very easy for us to tell the click rates. We just have to push a button and it's right in front of us. So the click rate is the percentage that tells you how many emails 
in this case, the school has sent that were successfully opened. So they can see, did they, does do you as the applicant, did you open 20% of them, 60%, 80%, zero, 100? And it can be used as one indication of engagement. Click rate, our word of the day. That's right. I used to tell my classmate, Jeffy Bezos, hey, Jeffy, man, you got to watch that click rate with that Amazon thing you're doing there. <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't take me seriously for a while, but, you know, sort of took off. So I'm glad he paid attention. <laughs> so now you're Al Gore created the Internet. Now you created Amazon. Is that what you're trying to say? That's right. I wanna, Hey, look, you got to do something about this book thing. You can expand this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the big number. The, the inside joke that you guys don't know is that Dave and I keep forgetting the big number. And we have to go back and re-record it. But right. this time I'm remembering it. So you get a trifecta on the big numbers this time. All righty. They're 93, 92, and 73. Wow. 93, 92, and 73. So last week I shared a big number from you. It was 61. It was a percentage of students that they're the percentage of provosts based on this survey that Inside Higher Ed had done, that believe that after the pandemic is over, there will be more online classes. So I'm going back to that survey again of these 183 provosts from public, private, and nonprofit institutions. And this time, the question is, is the liberal arts central to undergraduate studies? The answer, 93%, almost 19 out of 20 said, a liberal arts foundation is central to undergrad studies. So you're thinking, oh, that's pretty good. Well, the news gets worse after here. 92% say liberal arts education is not well understood by the public. Yes. And then 73% say they expect to see a number of liberal arts colleges close in the next five years. Because everybody's pushing STEM, 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 STEM. So 93% central, 92% not understood, 73% expect a number of underfunded colleges to close. All right, Dave, take it away, my friend. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Well, it was a great article, and it had really three specific parts. So what I'm going to do is an overview, and then you're obviously going to take where you want to take it in terms of uh, in-depth discussion. It's called The Employment Mismatch. It's an article by Karen Fisher uh, from Inside Higher Ed. It's a survey by The Chronicle and the American Public Media Marketplace where uh, they looked at employers and found that, number one, one half of employers – say that they have trouble finding recent graduates, graduates that are qualified to fill the positions at their company organizations. One third gave colleges fair to poor marks for producing successful employees, and they dinged bachelor degree holders for lacking basic workplace proficiencies such as adaptability, communication skills, and the ability to solve complex problems. In the words of David E. Boyes, the CEO for a Northern Virginia technologically, technology company, current college graduates are, quote, woefully unprepared. So the article looked at why is this? Well, number one, they said no, it wasn't so much the colleges as it was changes in workplace expectations. It used to be that colleges uh, that that employees weren't expecting college graduates to know everything. In fact, many employees, recent grads, were employees in training and were given up to a year to get familiar with the job for which they were being employed for. But this has changed, especially since kids move around a lot, and many of them go from job to job in less than six months. So now employees very much want kids to be Johnny on the spot right from the go. And secondly, there are three times more Americans that have college degrees now than a generation ago. So the expectations are just so much greater that everybody coming to the employee, our college graduates, are fully prepared. But as one uh, critic says, colleges are not preparing students in written and oral communication, decision-making, 
and analytical uh, skills. So there's a mismatch in their expectations. But the colleges are pushing back because the colleges are thinking, wait a sec, we train these kids in the abstract, not in vocational skills. And employees want book smarts that translate into the real world. But they college many colleges think that their duty is to train uh, students to think broadly, not narrowly. And it's the business's job to teach teach the specific vocational skills. So basically, let me let me wrap up. Uh, what is the solution? And what this article really points to is three basic things that employees look for. They start off with an anecdote saying that many kids and parents look at prestige, 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 prestige in terms of picking a college. But that is way down the list for many uh, companies. The number one thing they look at is internships and the real work experience that internships provide. In fact, many employees see internships as four times more important than a college's reputation in training the employees that they're looking for. And then second on the list is relevant uh, coursework related to their field of employment. And lower down is GPA. The, the college reputation is nowhere on the top four. And just to wrap this up before I get to give it to you, Mark, uh, Ant Anthony Carnavale, the director of Georgetown uh, University Center on Education and Workforce, says, quote, students and families overestimate the importance of selectivity enormously, okay? And um, the McGuire Associates, who also did this study, says that an internship is the single most important credential for recent college graduates. So let me stop right there, Mark, and, and take it to you and think where you want to take this discussion. Yeah, so this to me is a really, really, really important article because we know that a lot of people are consumed by prestige. May not use that word prestige. They may just think that prestige is tantamount to a good college. They may say they're consumed with a good college. And they might define a good college as, a, and people define it differently. Some people define it as one that's high in the rankings. Some people define it as one that when I mention the school to everybody in my peer group, they say, wow, that's an amazing school. Some people just define it by low acceptance rates and some people define it by high test scores. That's my experience of the four things people use to define a really good college. And a lot of times when people are obsessed with prestige factors, it really breaks down into two categories. There are people that just want to impress their social circle and it's disconnected from job outcomes. But I think the majority of people are focused on that because they believe that it's going to be the thing that's going to open up more opportunities for their child. And but but that's just the theory. Is that actually tested? And this is what this study does. Now, in in the interest of full candor, the study was done in 2012. Okay, so it is nine years old, but it's hard to believe that anything has drastically shifted since then. And so what happened in the study is that, you know, inside higher ed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what happened was the, chron the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, paired up with American Public Media Marketplace, and they actually reached out to 50,000 different employers, but over 700 responded. It was a very detailed survey. So anyone who knows anything about surveys, 700 is a really good sample size. And this is, you know, credible information that you can take away. And so they wanted to know, okay, the public is so impressed with brand name and selectivity and, and so much money is spent on that. In fact, David has been said that um, there are three billion, billion dollar industries, you know, built around the whole college admission process. You know, there's a whole test prep industry, there's independent college counselors and, and then lists and then the college board. And test taking fees, sending test scores, taking AP and CLEP exams, and buying lists of names through student search. So you have $3 billion industries that are built around this whole obsession with trying to get into highly selective schools. But what the article says is, well, what do employers value? So I want to start with an illustration. 
So you guys, regular listeners, you know my daughter played travel AU basketball, very, very high competitive level. She played for me at 18. And one of the things I used to get roped into doing is my service. You know, all the parents, you got to help in some way at, at a lot of these AAU games. Mark, go work the score table. So I'd be down there, you know, the one putting the points on the board, getting yelled at by parents when you get it wrong. <laughs> that was one of my jobs. So at times I had to train somebody new, I had to train somebody new to come in and, and, and do that job of how do you work the scoreboard? So. In my illustration, what if instead of somebody putting two points up when someone hits a basket, three points up for a three-pointer, one point for a free throw, they started keeping track every time somebody dribbled the basketball and they got consumed with dribbles. Oh, this, this team dribbled 761 times. This team dribbled 531 times. And I say that to say it's like the public is fixated on measuring the wrong thing. Right. When it comes to what actually matters, it's not about the dribbles. It's about the points on the board and what employers are saying. It's not about brand name degree. It didn't even crack the top three things that they value in the study. So I don't know if that illustration worked. It felt a little weak, but I tried. <laughs> well, you know, I got it. OK, at least you got it. I had another one at the last second. I changed it. I was going to use Usain Bolt in a running right. one. And I, last second, I just shifted gears. That's so right. I think, I think Anika may roll her eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Anika, if I said Anika, what would you give it on a scale of 1 to 10? 1.5. One, one <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if on a good day. Okay. And I say, you're a tough grader. She's like, darn right I am. All right. So here we go. So this is my favorite quote from this article. Students don't just want internships. They need them. When evaluating recent graduates, employers weigh internships most heavily, more so than the applicant's college they attended. Check this out. More so than their grades. Now, this will surprise a lot of people because if people aren't focused on the status of a school and the selectivity of a school and the prestige of a school, they're oftentimes focused on getting the right major. Oh, you got to go into, you got to go into STEM. You got to go into engineering. You got to go to computer science. Got to do pre-med. More focused than their major. According to the survey commissioned by the Chronicle and American Public Media's Marketplace McGuire, over 700 respondents. Now, here's another quote. An internship is the single most important credential for recent college grads to have on their resume, wrote McGuire Associates higher education consulting firm conducting the survey. Here's another one. Employers want graduates to have real world experience. Internships and work during college matter the most. Employers said that each of those was, check this out, four times as important as the college's reputation. I got to say that again. Talking about internships and work during college, employers said each of those internships and work during college was four times as important as the college's reputation. Now, check this out, which they, re which they rated as the least important. They say relevance of coursework and grade point average rounded out the bottom of the list. Yep. This means, here's a quote, another quote from the article. This means a standout student at an unknown college will likely catch a recruiter's eye if they have the right experience. Standout student at an unknown co college is going to catch a recruiter's eye. Now, some time ago, I said I wanted to do a lot of interviews with people at colleges, actually at colleges, including things like academic success centers, disability centers, multicultural affairs, residential life and counseling. And I still want to get to all of them, and eventually I will. But it was a reason why I picked the Career Center as the first one. And we interviewed Emily Griffin. If you haven't heard that interview, I know six time brought it up in this podcast already. Go back and listen. Just go to your cosmonkid.com, type in Emily Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-E-N. I picked that because of how important the Career Center is. And friends, if you heard my interview with Nancy Bean, who is the past president of, N of NACAC, National Association of College Admission Counselor, she hammered home on this point as well. Freshman students, get to the Career Center. Find out right away what's their four-year plan for you because of the importance of internships. And there's a reason why we've done so many spotlights on schools with co-ops and strong internships. Yep. Quick story. So 
Some of you are into sneakers and sports may have heard of the company And One. I know Dave knows And One. They, yeah. They're a big shoe company. And at one time, they had the second most NBA players under contract in Nike. They had 75 NBA players under contract. So I'm friends with their founder, Seth Berger. In fact, when he was uh, when I was at West Town, he came through as a parent. And not only was he admitted, but then our kids were in the same grade. We hung out a lot. And sometimes when I go to Pennsylvania, I stayed at his house. And so I oftentimes will pick Seth's brain because, it's a bit, you know, he ran a multi-million dollar company, several hundred million dollar company before he sold it. And I would ask him, Seth, how much did you focus on the brand name of the school when it came to your hiring decisions? And he was like, well, Mark, you know, we had a number of schools that we prioritized. There's no question about it. But they weren't always the ones that people thought that they were. And I, I'm not going to mention names, but I threw out certain names and he would sometimes say, no, we didn't, we didn't like that. We didn't think that graduate had the same skill set as such and such school. By the way, he absolutely loves liberal arts and sciences schools like Haverford, Skidmore, F&M, Lafayette. I mean, in fact, his own son's at Lafayette right now, one of his sons. And so... The point I'm bringing and bringing this up is I've seen over and over, Dave, that who corporate America looks at as great colleges is not the same as what the public thinks by the rankings. Yeah. It's a completely different list. No one's here to say that everybody thinks all colleges are the same. They don't. So I'm not making that point. Yeah. But they they have a list. And a lot of times it's based on the, what we're talking about right now. Internships, co-ops. Real life work experiences. Yep. You'll find schools like Cincinnati and Drexel and schools like that really high on employers lists. Northeastern and many, many others because of these types of practical opportunities that they have. Rochester Institute of Technology. I could go on and on and on. I don't want Caltech in Pasadena, California. Mills in Oakland, California. Stony Brook in Long Island. University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont. FAMU, the HBCU in Tallahassee, Florida. Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, Oregon State in Corvallis, Oregon, Union in Schenectady, New York, Center in Danville, Kentucky, Pitzer in Claremont, California, Lehigh in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Temple also in Pennsylvania, but in Philly, Wentworth in Boston, Reed in Portland, Oregon, and the University of Washington in Seattle. When you start mentioning names, you leave other ones out. But the point is, who employers think are great is not what the public thinks. In fact, the article talked about how Boeing, remember that, David, talked about how Boeing it did a, Boeing basically keeps track of what they think of the education. They basically grade colleges based on the caliber of grads they get. Yeah. And they keep it completely confidential. They don't, they don't release it to the public. But they say they do give feedback back to the schools to say, listen, you got to step it up in this area because your grads aren't cutting it. Right. And I've had other conversations with other employers as well. And their list of schools that they really, really like are oftentimes quite different than what the public thinks. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of the schools that, that people think are really good are also high on the list. This is not bashing highly selective schools. I'm just saying some of the ones that are highly selective don't score well with employers. And, and some of the ones that you've never even heard of are amazing with employers. Well, as Anthony Carnevale points out, uh, the director of the Georgetown University Center of Education, quote, the economy is much more democratic than higher education is. Correct. Correct. And I want to shout out my uh, uh, my daughter, Joyce, best friend, Nabia. So they started out of Valdosta State together, and she always wanted to be a merchandise buyer. And she had all kinds of internships consistently throughout her whole time in undergraduate and she ended up with six incredible offers right at graduation. I mean, companies like Sprite, she ended up going, I don't know these names, Louis Vuitton. Is that the brand name, Dave? Louis Vuitton? No, Am I really? saying it right? Yeah, $3,000, $4,000 bags that look like plastic. <laughs> well, she, took, she takes a Louis Vuitton job. Her first day on the job was this last week. Nobody at the company was under 28 except her. And why does she get that job? One, her incredible internships that she had every single semester. And she also said that Valdosta State has a fantastic career center. And so meanwhile, I'm not going to mention names, but I have worked with students who have graduated from some of the most prestigious schools in the country. If I mentioned their names, your eyes would be like, wow, that were unemployed three months after graduating, Dave. Yep. 
as you say, you can't eat prestige. You can't sell it either. <laughs> well, and this is not an anti-prestige thing. This is just saying that what we're trying to do is bring people's thinking in accordance with how the real world works. Right. And and one of the reasons why why schools why employers love internships is because it brings them that real world perspective. Here's a, a quote from the article from Shannon Duffy. She graduated from Xavier University in Ohio with a degree in nursing. And she says this, internships helped me see obstacles that arose in the clinical practice. She said the coursework taught me what a bacterial infection was and that it could be cured with antibiotics. But my experience revealed to me that the patient may not understand instructions, may not have enough money to fill a prescription, or may not finish the prescribed course. And Dave, remember the quote about the person that sent out the wrong email to 40 people? You want to talk about that? Well, yeah. It's like when I make a mistake in school, I get a B plus or a B minus. But at work, you actually have to correct that mistake. So she had to send out 41 corrective emails. And I'm sure she got an earful from her bosses as well. <laughs> so. so the article talks about Rachel Vandernick, a senior at Messiah College in, in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. She says she learned how to fail by a real world experience. It happened during one of her, check this out, six internships she had at Messiah College, six. She inadvertently sent the wrong press release to 40 news outlets in a PR job she had of her public relations firm. And, and, and like Dave says, she says, failure meant failure in school is a B minus, showing up to class late, not knowing how to answer professor's question. Failure in my internship meant other people in the company's brand were at stake. And she said, I learned how to clean up a mistake. And this is the kind of thing that the article talks about, this real world experience where your education is integrated into real life. Now, the article does say, listen, we this is not an anti-degree article at all, is it, Dave? They say we they said that a degree is just the basics to even get considered for most jobs. And they say they like the fact that a degree shows that you have the stick to itiveness and the discipline, and the ambition. And they also point out that uh, nowhere has a degree been more important because for whatever employers might think about the unpreparedness of college graduates, they will not consider anybody but college graduates. <laughs> so. Right, 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 right. So this is not an anti, you know, this is not Google paying people 100 grand to drop out of college like they were doing. This is not that at all. This is saying, no, you don't even get sniffed at without a degree. However, that's right. However, let's talk about when we're looking at a sea of people with degrees, let's talk about who we pick and why we pick them. Right. Let's let's bring that perspective to light. And so I got one more thing to say, Dave, but any anything else you want to share? No, I think I think you've got did a good roundup there. I mean, the bottom line is internships are extremely important. Real life experience is extremely important. Well, the other thing I wanted to add that the article says is it says the ability to problem solve yeah. is what they look for. And when I interviewed uh, Idan Shahar, I don't know if it, it's just, but well, Idan Shahar is getting a lot of shout outs. You mentioned him last week. Yeah. I don't know if it was my interview with Idan, CEO of Test Innovators, or just my individual, he's a friend, individual conversations with him. It might have just been individual conversations with him, Dave. But he said, Mark, you know what I look for when I'm hiring people? I don't look, I, I don't look at where they go to college. That's not my focus. Now, don't get me wrong. He said, I've learned, like, for example, University of Washington has like some credible programs. It's not like, I'm oblivious to that. But he says, you know what I value? I value problem solvers. I need people that can think quickly on their feet, not people that have stuffed their cranium with a lot of knowledge. And this is very consistent with, with what the article also says. So in addition to internships, it quotes Sinai No Mine Associates, a firm that works with high-tech companies like Cisco and IBM. And this is what it says. What we look for, it says, is how to analyze large amounts of data and construct a cogent argument. It's not a technical skill. It's knowing how to think. Yeah. So in addition to internships, the, the, the research of these 706 uh, employers say we look for the ability to think and we look for the ability to communicate well. Because it says, one, one, one quote in the article says, we are graduating people with woefully inadequate interview skills. So communication skills, problem-solving skills, critical thinking skills, which, by the way, you get in the liberal arts and in social sciences and humanities, also in the science and scientific training method can do that, and internships. Final comments, Dave? 
No, I think you wrapped it up well. I think you wrapped it up well. So, you know, it's, it's the real life experience that they, they value. And, and that's what you, the inter, that, that's why internships are so valuable. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. Okay, friends, really, really excited about this new countdown I'm going to gonna roll out here. And I feel like Princeton Review should be giving us some money on this one because I'm going to be promoting them a lot here, here Lisa. Uh, Princeton Review does something that I really like. They, they have a, a, a list of, it's a list of 63 different areas where they, uh, based on their surveys, they rank schools like, all kinds of them, you know, all kinds of different things, like best classroom instruction, best food, this, that, the other. And I thought it'd be fun to go through some of these lists. And the way they do it is they interview over 143,000 people on 386 campuses. So they do about 400 interviews on each campus and, you know, they're professionally done and then they scale them. And 400 is not 4,000. And obviously this is not super precise, but overall I think it'll be fun and it'll be interesting. So I'm going to go through some of these lists and over the next several weeks, weeks and months, because I think they'll be interesting to people. So the first one, most conservative students, campuses with the most conservative students. So what they do, and once again, this is all based on there's 400 surveys they do on each campus. So I'm going to count them down from 20 to one coming in 20th place, University of South Carolina in Columbia. In 19th place, University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio. 18th place, University of Dallas, Irving, Texas. 17th, University of North Dakota, Grand Forks, North Dakota. 16th, Fairfield University, Fairfield, Connecticut. 15th, Montana Tech in Butte, Montana. In fourth, I used to say butt, by the way. Then I had a client up there. <laughs> Don't and do said, that. <laughs> it's not butt, Mark. It's cute. That's why I paused there. It was so embarrassing the first time I did it. Clearly, I'm not a Montana scholar. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not, <laughs> probably never. Number 14, Auburn University, Auburn, Alabama. Number 13, Angelo State University, San Angelo, Texas. Number 12, Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois. There's two Wheatons out there. The Massachusetts, not that one, the Wheaton, Illinois, the one Billy Graham went to. Number 11, Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is really a bastion for conservatism. So that should not be surprising, that old Spartanburg area. Number 10, we just did a spotlight on this, Lisa, Clemson University, Clemson, South Carolina, 10th most conservative school. Number nine, Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. Number eight, TCU, Texas Christian, Fort Worth. Number seven, one of the three all-male colleges still around, Hampton Sydney College in Hampton Sydney, Virginia. Number six, Grove City College, Grove City, PA, Christian School. Number five, U.S. Military Academy, West Point. Number four, U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado. Number three, another one we did a spotlight on, Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. Number two, another one we did a spotlight on, Baylor University, Waco, Texas. And the winner, based on 400 surveys, well, 143,000 surveys, but 400 per campus, College of the Ozarks in Point Outlook, Missouri. Any thoughts, Anique? Um, see, I told you I was going to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to call you, Anique. I'm not even going to correct myself uh, it's anymore. It's easier. It's just easier. <laughs> yeah. Any thoughts on that, Lisa? Well, being from Missouri, that does not surprise me. Uh, the, the Ozarks takes the top spot. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, and I think it's great to have a list like that so, you know, kids kind of know where they might fit in and where they might not fit in. So, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do the, let's do the most liberal schools next week. That'll be All fun. Right, fair enough. <laughs> awesome. All right. Let's, let's dive into our question, which comes from our own Dave himself this week. Right. This is a question from a listener, Dave Williams, a dad in Chicago. Dave wants to know why in the world would Tulane waitlist over 12,000 students and take none in 2020? It makes absolutely no sense to me. And I'm sure he speaks for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I want to tread lightly uh, on this because I really should just interview Jeff Schiffman, who's director of admission at Tulane, and ask him directly these questions. So I want to presume and not be presumptive and say something that 
he wouldn't say. However, the good thing is Schiffman's got his own blog, and he's commented quite a bit on on his blog about Tulane's approach to the waitlist. So while I don't have Schiffman here to ask him some of these questions directly, I can draw from comments he's made on his blog about the waitlist, and I will draw heavily on that. And also will engage a little bit of conjecture, uh, and I will let you know when I'm sharing what I think is going on just to differentiate between what's what my opinion is versus what Schiffman's actually said. So let's dive in. So first of all, I want, the first thing I want to say is that the 12,813 that they waitlisted in 2020 was an aberration. Um, it was significantly more than what they've done in other years. Uh, let's look at the year before. They waitlisted 5,412 which is less than half of the 20, of the 12,813. Well, you say that's still a ridiculous amount. That's like three wait lists for every one spot. What's going on? So, so let's look a little bit at how wait lists work. So, so when, when a school puts people on a wait list, it doesn't mean the number of people they put on the wait list are actually the real number that are on the wait list. So what they're going to do is they're going to ask you, do you want to accept a spot on the wait list? And, Let's just look at 2019 numbers. So Tulane waitlisted 5,412 and 1,371 chose to stay on the waitlist. So sometimes people are like, no, I got another schools I like more, so I don't need to do that. Or, or sometimes people are like, well, if you are not interested in me, then I'm not interested in you. Like I hear that all the time from students. So there's various reasons why people choose not to go on the waitlist. So, but basically one out of every four people that they waitlisted chose to be on the waitlist. So I know some people are thinking, well, 1,371, it still sounds like a lot. But actually, that's not really the true picture. So one of the one of the tips that, that Schiffman has on his blog, he says, please only accept a spot on the waitlist if you are going to say yes to the offer. Now, I'll be honest, I don't agree with that, but that is a tip. And the reason why I don't agree with that is because you as an applicant, you have every right, if you're waitlisted five schools that you like more than when you're admitted, you have every right to, to indicate you want to be on five waitlists. The school can't have all the power in this dynamic. So that that is some advice he gives. And of course, that's great advice for Tulane. It's his job. He's doing his job to look out for Tulane, but that's not necessarily always what's best for you. But I bring it up because let's let's look at these 1,371 that accepted spots on the waitlist. In reality... Maybe only one fifth of that 1371 would actually accept a spot if truly offered to Tulane. Because a lot of times people do a knee jerk reaction where they say, sure, I'll stay on the wait list. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's just a bit of a bruised ego. It's just like a natural gut reaction. Sometimes you just want to keep all your options open. But then other times, you know, you get into other schools off their wait list and you're like, you take that offer. Or the school that you got in initially where you deposited at, it starts to look more and more appealing to you. Maybe you get into like a, you know, a Facebook group or some kind of social media group where you start meeting students who are coming or you attend an orientation or you come back and you tour campus and, and this school starts to grow on you. You're like, no, I, I wouldn't take that spot. So, so even when they have 1371, you know, on their wait list, it, in reality, they're looking at that and saying, well, that might be like 250 people really that we could go to. If we needed to. And remember, wait lists are not just put in an ordinal list where like, okay, you're number three, you're number eight. It's not how it works. Like what happens is let's say you're trying your best to have 50 states and you only had looking we're going to go back to Montana again here for this at least. It doesn't be the Montana episode. But uh, let's say in reality, you only had one kid coming from Montana and then you admit it them and then they turn you down. You might go to your wait list and try to replace them with somebody else from Montana so you can. Say in our incoming class, we had 44 states. So you want to cast a wide net. And so reality, that 50, over 5,000 might be 250. Um, any thoughts so far? Well, I guess that makes sense. It does make the numbers seem more reasonable um, when you start putting it through a funnel like that. Mm -hmm. And it's important to do that, you know, just to kind of just to kind of put it in perspective. Now, other schools ha operate differently. And I will admit, Tulane's numbers were extremely high. They were an outlier. I'm not going to say that they weren't an outlier. There's no other school that waitlisted that many students. And, and the real killer is that, it, at least according to Common Data Set, they took zero. Now, schools report out to Common Data Set. So those numbers come directly from the school. 
But Schiffman says in his blog that they actually didn't take zero off the wait list. They initially looked like zero, but there was some movement later on in the year, and it ended up that they took 50. So that sounds a little better versus taking zero. But the time they reported the data out to Common Data Set, they didn't take any off the wait list, and nor did they in the year before. That year they had 5,400 or 50, over 5,000 in 19. They took zero that year too. So they had back-to-back years where it looked like they took zero, but then there was, but then there was some movement that occurred. Uh, but other schools get a higher percentage. Like, so I looked at Stanford's numbers, uh, Lisa, and the last two years, uh, 77% and 83% of the kids they waitlisted chose to be on a wait list. So, you know, depending on sort of your brand strength in the marketplace, you don't have to waitlist as many people to have a real good legitimate bench that you can go to. So, so Stanford waitlisted the last couple of years, like 700 and 800. And like I said, about three quarters to 80 percent actually stayed on that wait list. So these numbers are going to vary from school to school. Now, let's do let's look a little bit more specifically at the 12,813. You're like, well, why would they like more than double the year before? And we have to remember this was the pandemic year. Now, this is a this is a quote right from Jeff Schiffman, right from his blog. And so the question says, is the wait list larger because of COVID-19? And and here's what he says. At many colleges around the U.S., it is sure it, and he underlines this, it sure is. There are many uncertainties right now. So you're going to see college and universities with larger wait lists. And, And that's true for four unique reasons. One, lots of international students and people don't know if they could come. Keep this in mind. We're looking back at it and we're looking back and saying, well, they took zero. But you don't know that at the time. You don't know what percentage of people are going to come. But some of the uncertainties in the pandemic, international students, and and at least as I talk to admission officer after admission officer, this is one of the biggest fears that they have right now. Right now, they don't know if they're international students, like right now what's going on in India. Yeah. They don't know if they're going to be able to come. I just had one tell me, Mark, we've got 40 students coming from India. I don't know if any of them are going to be able to come. Mm Mm-hmm. And and I hear this all the time, especially international students. So that added a unique variable. Can international students get get visas? A second one, will people be in the financial position to come or have their finances changed significantly because of the pandemic? Uh, So the point is, there really were some unique variables, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. A third one, are people going to be scared away by COVID? They don't want to send their kid that far away from home. They don't want to come to New Orleans. I'm going to stay in, you know, Minnesota. I'm going to stay in Missouri. I'm going to stay in California. I don't want to go away that far from far. I mean, there's a lot of research that showed people chose to stay closer to home with the pandemic. And, and then the fourth one, if if school goes online, I'm not paying all that money. I was talking to a parent earlier today that was furious about what they had to pay for their kid to be at home and, you know, and take classes. And so a lot of people... Or like, Dave, I'm not paying that money for my kid to go to Yale. I'm not, that's not going to do it. And so for all those reasons, schools really felt the need to have um, a much deeper bench in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and any any comments, thoughts so far? Well, I think that, you know, that's understandable on the one hand. On the other hand, you, know, you get definitely get the sense that Tulane is looking out for Tulane. And I wonder about those kids who, you know, get put on that wait list and, have some hope maybe that it's going to work out for them, but really it's sort of more like a lottery ticket kind of situation. I know I've seen some schools um, tell kids like you're on the wait list. Our movement on the wait list is generally, you know, X percent. We generally take this range of students off the wait list. So kids can really get a more realistic picture of what being on the wait list would mean at that particular school. And I, I would hope that schools would move more towards transparency in that direction. I agree 100%. And that applies to deferrals as well. I love it when schools share those kinds of numbers. What are historical numbers move? I really find that helps kids to put things in perspective. One school that did a great job of that this year was was right where you're at. Lisa lives in Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill. They they were fantastic with that. They, they indicated that less than 1% of kids the previous year got off their wait list. And and that was really helpful for my kids that got waitlisted at UNC this year, you know, because they could put in perspective and not have a lot of false hope. So I, I, I completely agree with you. So so there's a couple other points I, I, I want to make. Um, there, there are three other reasons why schools waitlist. Now, 
this is right from right from Schiffman's blog. He focuses just on the one main reason, which is basically an insurance policy in case you don't get the kids that you initially admitted. So he, this is a que- how he answers this question. He says, what is a wait list anyway? And then he says, every year, colleges and universities have a group of students who are qualified to gain admission, yet these institutions are unsure if they have space available in their class. Colleges monitor the number of students who accept their offer, and they pull from the wait list in order to create the size and desired makeup of their incoming class. It's a necessary part of enrollment management process at schools, yet we also understand the frust- frustration and anticipation it can cause our applicants. So he focuses on a wait list as insurance policy in case you don't get the yield on in different institutional priorities, you know, of the kids you admit. So that's the traditional thing. However, there's another major reason why schools wait list. And I was having a conversation with an admission officer literally about this. Let's see. Two days ago, we we're having this conversation It's an age old debate. And, and this is how it goes. It's a hot debate in admission offices. I still have bruises from my debates with the other associate director of admission in my last few years of admissions. Her name was Heather. Shout out to Heather. And she took one side of the debate and I took the other side. And it it wasn't always productive because we were both pretty dug in in our views. So there's an age old debate in these admission offices. If somebody completely met the admission standard, do you owe it to them to let them know that they were admissible. Like you're an acceptable applicant. Sure, you were not a priority compared to some others, but you completely meet our admission standard. And the way the debate goes is this. Some people say, listen, if you're not going to take someone off the wait list, that is cruel and unusual punishment. You may think you're doing a good thing for them by signaling to them that they were admissible, but all you're doing is like prolonging their attention and their fixation on you. And I was literally talking to a uh, an admission officer this week and she she's comes from the other perspective and she's like and she was like mark i was so happy because we had so many great kids this year that were completely admissible and i was able to convince our our admission office to wait list them because i think they deserve that um and i know from experience that students receive a wait list much better than a denial so i get the emotion of that every year i have people say at least i was wait listed and emotionally they handle it better I will admit I don't come down on that view because my view is like if if you're not going to ever take somebody off a wait list, it's better to just get it over with. But I definitely understand that. And I do know that people a lot of times are trying to be sensitive to um, kid self-esteem and how hard this admission process can be and how cruel it can be. And it just does feel better. It feels like a soft. Well, we call it a soft. No, the problem is people don't know it's a soft. No. Well, yeah, exactly. But the point is, some schools will wait list large swaths of people under the belief that they were completely admissible and they deserve the right to know that they were admissible. I'm not saying Tulane does that, because when you look at what Schiffman indicates in his blog, he doesn't indicate that. But that may not be something that he wants to get that transparent about either. Another thing, and this is really common, and I get this, and I was a part of this when I did admissions, is... You're, you're concerned about your relationships with the your feeder schools. So, for example, when I was sitting in the, the file reading process with one of the schools I sat in, um, not last year because of the pandemic, but the year before, a student came up and the school is not going to be able to take this student. And they were like, you know what? If we don't waitlist this kid, we may never see any more kids from that school because this is one of the strongest kids that they have. And we're going to signal to them. Like they don't have anybody good enough for us and we don't want to cut that supply of applicants off. And so that's another common reason why schools waitlist is to maintain your relationships with your feeders. And and I know that this is real. Like, you know, when I was doing college counseling in boarding school, I personally really, really liked Harry. Harry was our Yale rep. But all of the other private schools in the greater Philadelphia area, and there's a lot of private schools in greater Philadelphia, when we would get around and we would have our chats about the year, they did not like Harry because they felt like, like you got to walk on water. What in the world does he possibly want? I send them the most extraordinary applicants we've ever had and they still don't get in. And so a lot of times schools are very mindful of that and they want to wait list to maintain their feeder relationship out there. So what are your thoughts on that, Lisa? Well, I understand that. 
but it's not that great for the individual, the kid who's getting waitlisted. Because I think it's, you know, it's kind of like stringing somebody along if you really have no intention of ever taking that kid off the wait list. You know, that hope, hope is a wonderful thing, but it can be so painful, you know, if you're hoping in vain. And I think that a lot of kids on wait lists are hoping in vain. Yeah, that's why personally, I'm not a fan of waitlisting kids as a soft no to help their self-esteem and to make and to soften the pain. Because of the prolonged, you know, it, it, to me, it's like asking the homecoming queen if she'll if she'll go on a date with you and she keeps saying maybe. And now you fixate on the homecoming queen for two years and you could have like positive dates with other women in the school. But you got you fixate on the homecoming queen because she keeps saying maybe. Right. So that's how I look at it. But I, I have to admit and I would be a hypocrite if I didn't do this because I did this when I was in admissions. I was big into protecting relationships with feeders because you don't want to cut feeders off. Because you could lose out on like great kids for the next 20 years. And unfortunately, that still does maybe end up stringing the kid along a little bit. But you are sort of your it is your job to represent your institution. And you can't really afford to just shut down pipelines of talent. Yeah. I mean, it's a business, right? Yeah, it's a business. Yeah, yeah. It is. This is an aspect of the business. And so that is another component where you just don't want to lose your feeders. And sometimes it means that you have to accept some kids every now and then, too, to give them hope. Sometimes you have to accept some kids that maybe you wouldn't accept if it's just, look, this is five years in a row. We haven't taken anybody from the school. Like, I don't want to lose them as a feeder. So that can apply to both admits and to wait lists. So I totally get that. Now, this is hard for families to hear because all you can think or care about is your own baby. But in admissions or in placement, you have to think of all of the future students as well as the individual file in front of you. Now, the last reason, and this is kind of significant, and this happens a lot, and this is one of the uglier sides of admission, and I'm not saying Tulane does it, but I am saying this happens a lot out there. So one of the things that schools have discovered in the last five years is, more than five years, but it's been much more noticeable in the last five years, is you can keep your acceptance rate down by not accepting that many people I'm talking about really strong students. In fact, some of the strongest applicants in the college's applicant pool can be vulnerable to being waitlisted for the colleges and universities that use this approach to waitlisting. Because in this method, the student is being waitlisted mostly because the school doesn't think that they will come, that they will enroll, either because they rarely beat their competitors out for a kid this strong or because the student didn't demonstrate enough interest to convince the admission officers reading the file that they have a good shot at yielding this student. Put more people on wait lists and then work your wait list and try to see who on this wait list really will come. And sometimes the way it works is this is somebody reaches out and says, listen, there's a spot on a wait list, uh, you know, and are you are you interested? And in some cases, it's only if the person is interested in taking it that it actually ends up counting as an accept. If the person doesn't say they're interested in taking it, then it doesn't count in the numbers of as an accept. So it can be one way of keeping your acceptance rate low. It's not quite like ED, but with ED, but it but it is a way of ensuring that you have a higher yield because you don't have to accept as many people because you sort of see who on the waitlist would really come. Before you take them off the weight. Does that make any sense, Lisa? Well, it does. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And um, it's a very smart thing, again, from a business perspective to do because schools are competing to have the lowest rates of you know, admission. Uh, I, this one's more selective than the next because it helps them in the rankings. Um, but it is kind of a way of manipulating it. So I know it's misleading. And I don't know, it's, it kind of gives me a little bit of a bad feeling. Yeah, I, I I totally get it. I it this one feels a little it feels a little slimy to me, but I also understand why schools do it. Just knowing the business side of schools. Now, one thing Tulane also does, and they've been unapologetic about this, is they use early action as a recruitment tool to flip people from EA into ED. And um, an article came out a while ago where they said they flipped ninety five students from early action to early decision by saying, "Hey." your wait list there, you're deferred early, but if you flip to ED, we'll admit you. 
And so they're a high school that puts a lot of takes a lot of early decision kids. And when you do that, that means there's less slots. So that's another reason why, you know, why some of these kids, you know, stay off the wait list. So it's a complicated question. And I wanted to answer all the reasons why it happens. Hopefully Dave has an answer to his question. Any any final thoughts on it? Well, I guess it's just always important to remember that colleges, even the nonprofit ones, are, you know, a business. They're com- they're competing for students, they're competing with each other. And a lot of what happens in that process for students isn't personal either way, you know, either accepted, rejected or waitlisted. But there may be other factors going on that as a student, you couldn't even hope to understand. And just to kind of keep that in mind. Yeah, because, you know, what I always say is in admissions, it's not my job or my goal to give you a trophy. That's not my goal. My goal is to enroll my class. Mm-hmm. That's my goal. And so, yeah, I know it's nice that you, you know, you love to be able to have all these acceptances and feels great. And you would love to know that every single school you met the qualification for, you got accepted at. But, and I want you to feel good about this process. I don't want you to feel bad. But at the end of the day, my goal is to bring in the most gifted and talented, diverse class that I can have. And the more selective schools are also very conscious, especially the private ones, of trying to do it while being very conscious of what their admit rate is. And so they're trying like not to waste admits on spot people that aren't coming. You know, not everybody does that. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of schools, it is what it is. You know, you made the standard fine, we'll admit you and it is what it is. And you find that a lot more with public schools, but there is a certain sector of private schools that are very, very conscious of their admit rate. And they're partly going to be evaluated on that. Right. On, on the class. Did, and, and, and they, and look, I've said this before, acceptance rates is one of the big things that moves the needle. It's one of the things that will make people enroll. Uh, you know, the lower the acceptance rate, the higher the yield. The more people feel honors conferred on them. Wow, I got in this school with this low acceptance rate. And Tulane traditionally has been very, very good at understanding that and using things like early decision and the wait lists and that to, to have that selectivity, you know, increase their appeal. You know, so there you have it. I don't want to throw Tulane under the bus, though. It's a very good school with some absolutely fantastic programs, and people tend to love New Orleans. But Dave asked the question, and we want to give a straight answer. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's the admissions process, right? And then there's the academic process. And I think, you know, the academic process might have a different value system even than sometimes the admissions process does. So we can't conflate the two. Yeah, I mean, every year, well, not every year, but at least every other year I have someone going to Tulane. This is the first year in a while I have no one go to Tulane this year, but last year I had two that went. And, you know, I put it on a lot of lists because it does offer a lot of things that a lot of students I work with have. And it's gorgeous campus. And, you know, there's a lot to like about it. Um, but they're, they have an aggressive admission office. And some of what you see here is some of the aggression coming out in how they implement things. And, and a lot of people will probably say it's smart. Like, it's a lot of business savvy things that they do that um, not always don't always necessarily feel the best on the other end. Where do you come down on that, by the way, Lisa? Would you rather have? Oh, I'd rather get my heart broken up front. (laughs) I do not like ambiguity. And maybe I do not like that as an answer. That's just me personally. Other people are more patient and can tolerate stress better. You know, and I think, you know, it's just so important for families and students to really educate themselves about the intricacies of the admissions process so they can understand what they're dealing with, mm-hmm. what they're up against, and, and and sort of guard their hearts and protect themselves, you know, and, and use it as a learning experience. Because this won't be the last time you come up against a, a you know, very strategic marketing strategy that may or may not have your best interests at heart. That is so well said. And I'll close with this. The nice thing is this is public information that's available. You can you can Google any school and Google common data set and go to Section C, which is all the freshman admission information, and go to Section C2. And Section C2 is going to ask, how many people did you waitlist? How many people accepted a spot on your waitlist? And how many people did you take eventually off of that waitlist? And that Sure, things can change from year to year, but they usually don't drastically change. And that's usually a really good indication of how conservative a school is with their wait list. And and common data set information is available for past years, too. So if it's a school you're really interested in, go back and look at their last three years and see what they've done. And that's a really good way to 
be able to guard your heart and to get a realistic sense of how generous they are with their wait list or how liberal they are with their wait list. And so we'll close with data. <laughs> you can't, the numbers don't lie or do they? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Awesome. See you next week, Lisa. All right. Thanks. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, well, I am so excited about this interview with Courtney Minden, uh, VP of Enrollment at Babson College. And this is the first part of three in the new ways colleges recruit students. In part one, Courtney gives her backstory, including various admission roles that she's had. She explains the difference between what is a VP of enrollment and how is that different from a dean of admission or a director of admission? And she does a, gives the best explanation we've had on our podcast on that. And then Courtney explains what is the virtual renaissance? And how did she come to realize that this is what Babson needs to do right now, be part of a virtual renaissance? Listen and enjoy. Okay, friends, you're in for a treat today. I'm here with Courtney Minden, and Courtney is the VP of Enrollment at Babson College. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Courtney. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. So I, I am going to share a story, which I didn't even tell this to you, Courtney, but you're hearing this for the first time. So the way I find great people like Courtney sometimes is I listen to other interviews from people that I respect and I, I kind of stalk them. I'm like a, you know, just peeking in and I'm listening and I'm listening for people who are really knowledgeable, know their field and they're great communicators. And so uh, thanks to Brennan Barnard, he did an interview with Courtney and I loved how she communicated and I reached out to her. So no pressure, Courtney. Big shoes to fill. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I do. I know. That was a whole year ago, too. This was That was pre-COVID. Yes, pre-COVID. Absolutely. So why don't we start out, Courtney? Why don't you take a few minutes, tell us your backstory, where you grew up, any various admission roles you've had, and really anything you want to share with us. Yeah. So I grew up um, in Maine, actually, in a small town called Cape Elizabeth, right outside of Portland. Um, went to a public school, very small public school. I think I had a graduating class of around 80 students. And those of you who know anything about Maine, um, we have we have some great college uh, options. We have a, a you know wonderful uh, state system, but there was the uh, the Bowdoin, Bates, and Colby combination. And so I sort of went into college almost taking that for granted, you know, the, the notion of the private college um, and that I would probably go somewhere like Bowdoin, Bates, or Colby. Um, the other side of the coin is today, I, you, I can't even put into words how clueless I was about the entire <laughs> uh, admission process. Clueless, apathetic, maybe sometimes a little disrespectful, um, or uh, maybe to my parents. And, and you know, Mark, I am not sending this to my parents now that I've said this. Um, <laughs> Hopefully they don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> no, never went on a tour, sort of used, I can see some guides behind you, the Fisk Guide and and various, um, various books. I, I, I grew up in the last century. So I didn't have the internet um, and really found um, a community and a home in a, a, a ironically a college like Bowdoin Bates Colby, but down in Connecticut, Connecticut College. And uh, I will say, having not known anything about the admission process, um, I feel very lucky that they wanted to admit me at the time. Um, <laughs> but also, as I realized wow, they admitted me. Why did they admit me? And how many more me's are there? And how do you figure out, how, you know, this is my the very beginning of my data management brain. Um, if I'm admitting this many, how do I know that I'm going to have a class of 400, 700, 800? And how do I know I'm going to have a certain amount of, um, you know, public school kids versus private. And I started really kind of going down that rabbit hole of who is the magician that made this happen. And at the same time, I, I loved being on a college campus and it was really a whole new world for me, which kind of prompted me to think, how, you know, how can I get more involved in the admission process? And so I actually ended up being a summer tour guide and mm -hmm. which parlayed into being a, a full year tour guide, which parlayed into I'm being an admission fellow and doing interviews and, and, you know, sort of um, the rest is history, you know, now here at um, Babson, I can say since I graduated, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal, I'll show my age a little bit, graduated from Connecticut college in 1997, which means I graduated from high school in 1993. I have never been off a college campus professionally. Good ever. for you. 
So I, 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 after college, I came up to Boston and I had, I was lucky enough to have a job out, actually outside of admission, but in the realm of higher ed. And that was at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where I worked in graduate uh, admission briefly and then career development. Uh, knew I wanted to go to, to go into um, further higher education and opportunities. Knew that it didn't, ne didn't necessarily need to be uh, at the graduate level. I, I, I have found that I missed that whole that undergraduate spirit, the the sort of the talking to speaking to students who their whole lives are ahead of them and they are just really drinking from the fire hose in terms of opportunity. And um, and so I, I ultimately found my way back to admission through Tufts University. And I was there for 11 years and, and I it really did open the world to me in terms of um, global recruiting. I, I recruited internationally and I recruited locally. I, I got back up to Maine and visited Cape Elizabeth High School every year dutifully. And um, I also realized the magic of marketing. So uh, the magicians who are trying to figure out how many um, are going to, to enroll um, are bolstered by that, those, the create, creative spirit to say, all right, here is the school and here ha is how you're going to remember this school or find your community or you know, really sort of see the school as, as more than you know, a quad and some some brick buildings. And so I've really, uh, you know, sort of the cornerstone of my career as I've, as I've gone through is really thinking about how do I create a narrative around a school and what, and get, and get students excited about the opportunities um, of a college, which I've been doing at Babson since um, uh, probably nine, almost nine years ago this, this August. And so here we are. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, there's a question I don't think I've ever asked any bef anyone before. Can you let our listeners know what the difference in roles is between a VP of enrollment and a dean of admissions? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, I, some, I actually think the question also should be, what's the difference between a dean of admissions and sort of the, the, the a circus, uh, <laughs> circus <laughs> big top uh, operator? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the, the dean of admission is typically very focused on you know, one particular department, such as you know, undergraduate admission, or maybe the school of business, or, you know, really looking at a department within the, the greater school. What I see there, my role as a VP of enrollment management is more of how it, are the decisions we're making, you know, how do they um, advance the school's mission, strategic plan, how are we strategic? I have to sort of think in terms of what, where is Babson going to be five years from now, 10 years from now? It's our legacy. We, you know, we, we've been talking, particularly pre-COVID, the mm -hmm. biggest thing keeping me up at night was the fact that if you look at, at birth rates, um, the, there is what is happening called the birth dearth of the North. Mm -hmm. And so it's not happening tomorrow, but it is going to happen. So I see when I have my VP hat on, I'm thinking, all right, so in the next five years, where else am I going to go to be able to attract students when our bread and butter might be, be um, shrinking a bit? And what do I need to ask for to get that? So how am I going to think about financial aid? How am I going to think about access to education? How am I going to think about the attributes of a school that are going to resonate more with a particular kind of student or a geographic area or an international student and all that stuff. When I have my dean hat on, because I still I still actually have the dean hat, the dean um, title, I, I have a very long-winded business. <laughs> you know, when I see those long titles, I sometimes wonder, did somebody negotiate that to get every single thing in there? <laughs> well, you know what's funny? I was dean of admission and I was promoted into VP of enrollment management. And my marketing team came to me and said, congratulations, this is wonderful. We have a problem. Parents don't know what that is. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't really know what that is either. <laughs> and so I went to my boss, who's the president, and I said, nobody knows what I do anymore. So can I actually go back to being the dean uh, outwardly facing it when I'm talking about recruiting an undergraduate class or graduate uh, a graduate class? Because I also oversee the MBA program. And he said, 
if you can bring in a class, I don't care if you, if you call yourself the queen of the world. There you, you go. It. Just <laughs> bring in, line. in the class. So I settled for dean of admission slash enrollment management. But but as a dean, I'm really thinking more of in the now, how are we going to create an impactful community within the next five years? I think the VP of enrollment management is, oh, is over and above and also wearing many hats because I also have to advise the president on things like budgeting and, and um, yeah accreditation. And so basically a very long winded way of saying being a Dean of admission is way more fun. (laughs) No, that was a great answer. (laughs) That was a great answer. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 176 is the book. Now you tell me. And now you tell me a dozen college students who recently went through the college process give their advice to incoming students about what college life is really like. Some of the questions they answer are the following. How do you make the most of what's offered on campus? How do you make friends? What should you do when you're homesick? Or when your roommates party till all hours? You know, my daughter Joyce should have read that one. What are time drains to avoid? How do you come out ready for the real world? 12 college students share information that often isn't in the school catalog. And they share what made it work for them. This 260-page book is only $6. We will now return to my interview with Courtney Minden. So I'm going to transition and talk about our topic. And I'm very excited about this topic. Our regular listeners know that when I find a thought leader, I like to ask them what they're passionate about. And so in my pre-meeting with Courtney, she threw out several things. And as soon as she said, uh, what about the new ways colleges recruit? There's been some changes since the pandemic, and I don't see things going back. I was like, that's it. I know that's what our listeners would want would to would hear about. And it turns out that Courtney had just written an article for Inside Higher Ed called The Virtual Renaissance. And I know for a fact we would have taken that article and made it our hot topic in the news. When I read that article, I was like, we absolutely would be talking about it. But we don't have to do that. We have the real Courtney here today. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, this is the top of mind right now. I, you know, the, the title of my article is The Virtual Renaissance. Um, and, the, and that's not the first time I've said that. I've been saying that to students all throughout this year to say there is a renaissance of content out there right now. And it's yours for the taking. So if you if you look at 1993, Courtney, who had the Fisk Guide and and college visits, that's all I had. Mm-hmm. When you fast forward, I can basically go to any college website right now and find a live information session virtually. And the crazy thing is, is 99% of that content was generated as a reaction, a reaction to COVID, a Oh my goodness, it is March 17th. We just got got our um, decisions out the door and April is our prime time to to enroll a class um, from the field of admitted students. And from a Babson perspective, our crown jewel is the is the Babson ecosystem, getting onto campus and seeing the energy and the students in action, our foundry, which is a maker space, and just the, the energy on our campus is electric. And the, the, all I could think of between walking from the president's office when we decided to shut down and go remote to my office was, how am I going to show the students the electricity of the campus without bringing them to campus? And so I, I, I really didn't allow myself to ponder that too long, I just knew I had to act, and um, or we, we or we would be in a, a really precarious situation. So you brought the team together and said, "We've got to generate a lot of content in just a few days." You know, what element of our campus experience do we need to rethink from a virtual setting? So in three days, we created a an information session remotely with using using our current students, knowing that our current students would be off campus in three days for the year, gone. Wow! So we got them with a day's notice and said, "Can you um, can you present on campus life?" And so we we segmented out the different sections because again, you can't you can't replicate a campus visit, an in person campus visit 
into a virtual. It doesn't work. You have to segment it out in small bites. Um, you have to produce it in a different way and in, in oh, a different way of cons- it's a different way of consumption. And so over the past 16 months, we've created all of these opportunities to convey the energy using members of our community, our faculty members, our our students, oftentimes from their dorm room. Um, we've shown, we figured out ways to um, create a tour that can be done on campus, but you can't get out of your car. I call that the Jurassic Park tour. You can drive around, you can listen to a recording, you, you, you can't get out. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, things like that. And, you know, as, as we're starting to lift mask mandates and we're thinking with an optimistic eye towards the fall, I know that I'm not just going to hit the erase button on all of this content. We're going to, we're going to keep it going because what we learned and now, now that I'm less in the reactive survive phase and now I'm in the proactive thrive phase, I'm realizing all of the students that we were able to reach uh, without who we would not have otherwise, who would not have had the resources to come onto campus, who would not have had the time to come onto campus. Students are busy these days. Sports, sports teams and music and part-time jobs and family realities alone, we're taking for granted that it's really easy to, to wake up in California and say, oh, I want to sample the energy and, and vibrancy of Babson. I, I'm just going to go. You're not. But you can roll out of bed and and, and look to see what kind of content uh, we are providing. And so I'm actually really excited about what that's going to give our staff the opportunity to do beyond the whole, what do we do now? What do we do next year? And also free us up and to be able to do other things that won't take as much time because we have we already have the content produced. Well, one thing you said in our, our pre-meeting, and it really jarred me, you know, there's a there's a lot of talk about why is it particularly that more selective schools are up, you know, 10, 20, sometimes 30, and sometimes even more percent applicants from the previous year when everybody thought it was going to be a debacle with the pandemic. And the majority of people point to the movement toward the test optional policies. And while you, you know, admitted that was part of it, you think it's the increased um, opportunities through technology that probably plays even a bigger role than test optional in terms of the surge in applicants at certain schools. Right. There was a very, a very stark and dramatic change in mindset this year when it came to putting together a list. 99% of our students never got to take advantage of an on-campus visit before, before submitting an application for early and regular. And they, um, you know, they, they did do a, they might have done a college search during the summer or in between Zoom school, uh, but they still had the mindset of, I am still in the discovery phase when it's time to do um, my applications. So I think the mindset was very much wider net. So let me apply, not knowing what's going on with the vaccine, let me apply to more schools and sort of see where the chips fall. And and then maybe maybe I'll be able to go and visit after you know af- once once I'm admitted or once I enroll. And w- sort of the holes in some of those plans are we, again we didn't know whether y- we would be open in April and actually we weren't up in New England we were not um, doing in person we were able to do some um, in a very controlled manner but it did really push the students to to have to you know make some decisions online, but again, with more of a choice set. <laughs> and, and so I am, I'm, I'm very curious as to see, knowing the, um, knowing the, the, the fact that students, I, I, I know of one student who applied to 23 schools, and I, I'm going to implore the listeners, do not do that. Do not <laughs> apply to 23 schools. Donate the money to Babson. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the development office will funds. love the development <laughs> office will love that line there. <laughs> exactly. I start I started out in as director of annual giving, so I have an ear for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, it it I think it, it it increases the chance of analysis paralysis and the you know, it makes it that much harder to really find your community and find your fit. But that said, it, it really has challenge the colleges to think about who are the students who really understand Babson 
and um, and who really do see their you know see themselves and see their uh, contributions as being really primed for Babson. Now that I'm going to go back to, I understood that kind that type of student based on how I saw them engaged online. Mm-hmm. So when when I started to recognize names and said, oh, you know, Professor Beetlesbacher was talking about this student. They they came to her fashion retail um, class that she put on for for our applicants. That speaks much more volume than this what the, what we call the stealth applicants who mm-hmm. really just kind of hit the hit the Babson checkbox to say, I'll see whether I can uh, um, if I'm admitted, I'll 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 start to investigate it later. Um, I think that's a tricky little game. And that takes time to do it well, which is one of the reasons why you're dissuading 23, 23 applications. Now it's time for our college spotlight of the week. Friends, it is with enthusiasm and alacrity that I present to you the University of Minnesota Twin Cities for the spotlight. Dave, have you ever been to... University of Minnesota before? I have not. The closest I got was the Great Mall of America when my (laughs) flight got snowed in on the way to Chicago and I was had nothing to do, but I went to the Great Mall and I saw that indoor amusement park. (laughs) Well, you got close. Next time, my friend, if you're in Minneapolis or St. Paul's. So our regular listeners will remember me taking a trip to Minnesota. Almost two years ago, exactly. It was actually in May 2019. My brother Norm's daughter, Kristen, graduated. And I and I like to do this. So I went to her graduation. I like to take like a week when I go to places like that and visit all the colleges in the area. So I spent a good half a day at Carleton, St. Olaf, McAllister, Bethel. But University of Minnesota, this is something that people might find interesting. A lot of these colleges have hotels right on the campus. So I stayed on the hotel right on the campus for a few days and just got to interact with a lot of people. And to say I was impressed is an understatement. Now, you'll hear me refer to University of Minnesota Twin Cities. This is a, a world-class university. And, and the reason why you'll hear me refer to Twin Cities is because there's actually five University of Minnesotas as part of the whole University of Minnesota system. And by far, Twin Cities is the largest, but there's also campuses at Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester. So that's why when you hear Twin Cities, you're differentiating because University of Minnesota is actually a system with five different locations spread throughout the state. Now, what impressed me? Well, beautiful green spaces, old and new architecture, Mississippi River literally running right through your campus the caliber of their academic programs, um, the selectivity of the institution, and diversity of the institution, large international population. We'll get more into the numbers later. And then, of course, the proximity to Minneapolis and St. Paul's. It's like a lot of people like schools in the cities. And so ever since visiting there, I've been trying and trying and trying to get it on people's lists. And I'll throw it out there, and people will be like, Mark, Minnesota? Are you serious? I realize I'm probably contributing to this day by being a weather weenie. Yes, you are. (laughs) Everybody's like, that place is cold. (laughs) And so I haven't been as successful as I would like to be. I'm like, if you can just visit this place. I need to remember to tell people a lot of the buildings are linked with tunnels to help when it is just too cold outside. And then other people just if it they may not be wowed by the by their perception of the prestige of the institution, which if they look at it, it's an incredibly selective school. It's got incredible programs, but it's just not one of those names that immediately comes to people's mind unless you live in that area. And I'll tell you where I've had a lot of success, Dave. Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, a little bit in Colorado, and believe it or not, even that it's not cold, California. Those are the states where people have been willing to listen. Otherwise, I'm still working on I'm like, if you can just visit this institution, it ha- and I have I have in mind right now, I am going to be pressing them hard to take a trip to this place because it really, really impressed the heck out of me. Now, Dave and I, we opened our podcast by sharing what we thought was a really important article about the survey done over 700 employers about what they actually value when it comes to making hires. Now, one thing we never mentioned in that article is one of the questions they asked 
were asked was compare private nonprofit schools, liberal arts colleges, regional publics, uh, for profits, and flagships. And overall, what scored the highest was flagship universities. And flagships continue to be underrated. And that's why I'm systematically, slowly going around the country trying to do a spotlight on every flagship school for every state. In this case, we had a listener, and I, I feel bad that I can't recognize her because um, I like to recognize listeners. We had a listener write in and say, can you please do a spotlight on the University of Minnesota? I was delighted to do it because it exactly is one of these underrated gems that really people need to know more about it. So University of Minnesota, it has a lot of nicknames, and in a lot of cases, they're not unique only to them so it's frequently called the u of m what would be the other u of m dave well uh, university of maryland university of um probably university of maryland i'm actually really happy that you never said university of michigan right off the top of oh, university mind. of michigan that, right. <laughs> that makes me very happy my <laughs> rival school and then it's also called the u do you know the other the u the u uh Jeez. Um, Dave's coming off the graveyard shift again. You said well, he just no, came uh, off the graveyard shift before. Well, we <laughs> can record it on Saturday, now we're recording on Sunday. Oh, wait a sec. Uh, there's tons of universities called the U. <laughs> well, the most famous is is Miami. They oh, just okay. they go down and put the big giant U on the on their <clears throat> and all the you see the postcards all over with the U yeah. all over on the football field. So you're right. Others have that name as well, but those are the most common one. So they, you know, and they, and occasionally, rarely, they'll you'll you'll hear them referred to as UMN, which is actually U University M for Minnesota, and that's actually the website UMN.edu. But a little bit about the history: University of Minnesota founded in Minneapolis in 1851 as a college preparatory school, seven years before Minnesota even became a state. And to be honest, it had a very inauspicious start. It really struggled in its early years. It had to rely on donation after donation just to keep its doors open. And it got bailed out one time by William Aiken, who was the who was the governor of South Carolina. That kept it afloat for a while. And then it got a really nice reprieve. Dave and I, about a month ago, talked about the importance of the Morrill Act. The two Morrill Acts, one that birthed a bunch of HBCUs 30 years later, but the Morrill Act of 1862, which spawned so many of the land-grant institutions, and the University of Minnesota being one of them. So it, it was got approval through the Morrill Act in 1862, and then the funds came in in 1867. And believe it or not, that helped it for a decade, and then it still struggled. But then a, a flour miller named John Pillsbury, Ooh. he's credited with saving the school with a very, very large gift. And since then, Pillsbury is known as the father of the university. And let me guess, their mascot is the little doughboy? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're fixated with mascots, man. I know it's the gophers, but I was like. Ah, <laughs> see, you got me before I asked you. I was, the golden, the goldie, Goldie the gopher. He's right. called Goldie the gopher is the mascot. The nickname, the golden gopher. It's a good one. But you will, not surprisingly, if you visit this, visit. Minnesota, you will see Pillsbury Hall, named after the great John Pillsbury, credited as the father of the school. Now, this is one of the biggest universities in the United States. So big, David, has its own zip code. Okay. The university literally has its own zip code. And is one of these schools that has every imaginable thing you could ever want. For example, 35 different foreign languages are taught at this place. That's a lot of languages. Over 1,000 student groups. And Dave, you're always, always asking me about med. I don't know if you guys know this. Dave's always asking about med schools. So it is one of the very few schools in the country that has a med school, a dental school, a vet school, a law school, a pharmacy school, all in one place. Like not just spread throughout at different locations in the city. So they have all of that all on one campus. Med school, dental school, vet school, pharmacy, law school. Very, very few schools have that. And its $4 billion endowment places it number eight. Nine is actually UNC Chapel Hill. Ten is Wisconsin-Madison. And 11 is Michigan State. So the Big Ten Conference has five of the top 11 public school endowments. 
Only ones ahead of it, University of Texas, Texas A&M, University of Michigan, University of California, University of Virginia, and Ohio State, and the University of Pittsburgh. That's it. So a little fun fact there, a little, little factoid. Um, endowments tend not to be as important for public schools because they get that, that state funding. But trust me, when you have those kind, that kind of money, you can infuse it into your, into your academic program. And increasingly, public schools are starting to realize we, we need to act like private schools in raising our endowments because state legislatures keep cutting our budgets. We can't be so dependent on state legislature anymore. All right. When I say it's big, it's big. Whole campus, 2,730 acres. Oh, my goodness. In a city. Yeah, yeah. And that's because they have a lot of, you know, research forest lands and things like that. But it's big. It's a big campus. And campuses can receive dollars from the federal government for research. It receives the 17th most money of any school in the country for research. So it gets almost almost a billion dollars a year for research and development expenditures. And most of the public funding in the whole state of Minnesota is channeled through, you know, Minnesota Twin Cities. Now, how big is it? It's the sixth largest campus in the United States with 50, over 51,000 students. So it's huge. It's got 12 libraries on campus. It has over 300 research, education, and outreach centers. I know I'm getting into stats here, Dave, but I wanted to make the point it's big. 143 undergraduate programs and over 200 graduate degree programs. Oh, my goodness. It has the second most students in its graduate and professional schools in the country of any university. Over 16,000 students alone, Dave, in wow. graduate and professional schools. And its library, over 7 million volumes, one of the largest in the United States. Now, the schools divide it into 19 different colleges. That's right, 19. You're like, oh, my goodness. They keep track of that. Well, a lot of them are on the graduate and professional level, right? So we've got the School of Dentistry, the Law School, the Medical School, the College of Pharmacy, College of Veterinary Medicine. We've got the College of Continuing and Professional Studies for people taking ongoing classes, adults a lot of times taking ongoing courses after they've graduated or just taking some classes. Um, so there are a bunch of schools that are pr strictly for graduate and pre -prof or professionals. But the undergraduate colleges, and this is really important, I'm going to mention them. There are eight of them. And I'm going to come back to this time and time again, Dave, because the way they operate, they're completely organized around these eight individual colleges, almost like eight colleges almost function like separate entities in the school. Um, so you've got the Carlson School of Management, extremely, extremely strong reputation. I'll get into that later. College of Biological Sciences. I mean, these schools are strong. College of Design, College of Education and Human Development, College of Food, Agricultural and Natural Resources. Anytime you have a land grant school, Dave, you know you're going to have, we talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Yep. Agriculture is going to be strong. College of Liberal Arts, and then another extremely strong school, College of Science and Engineering, and then the School of Nursing, which I'll be talking about more as well later. Now, the campus is really unique because the Twin Cities campus actually has locations both in Minneapolis and St. Paul's. So sometimes, so this school is in, those are the two big school cities in the state, right? Yeah. They're located both in Minneapolis, both in St. Paul's. They have campuses. They're three miles apart. Technically, the St. Paul's location is in a neighborhood called Falcon Heights, but it's very unique that way. And the other thing that's unique is that the Minneapolis campus has both an East Bank location and a West Bank location that literally cross the Mississippi River. And there's a big, huge Washington Avenue bridge that connects the East Bank and the West Bank. You want a beautiful walk? Just walk across the, the, the Washington Avenue bridge right over the Mississippi, dividing the East Bank campus from the West Bank campus. It's about a 10 to 15 minute walk. Uh, the bus runs all the time too, though, if you're not a walker. So you can take the bus or you can take the light rail or you can do the walk. Walk is more pretty. Now, when you look at the campuses, the East Bank campus, um, a lot of times referred to as the main campus. Uh, this one's 307 acres, but there's a lot of stuff on here. It's the oldest part of campus. Lots of the buildings are over 100 years old. It's got the old historic district. It's got School of Humanities. It's got the College of Education and Human Development. It's got the whole mall area, which is sort of arguably seen as the center of the campus. 
It's got the Kaufman Memorial Union. Now, this union has everything, Dave. It's got the bowling and the dance, and it just, I mean, it's got all the bells and whistles in, in, the, in the student union. It really has got it all. It's one of those unions that you're like, you're like wow. Um, it's also where math classes are taught, physics, chemistry. Uh, College of Liberal Arts is on this campus, which is actually the largest public or private school in the whole state of Minnesota. It's got the very famous College of Science and Engineering. In 2018, it was put on the National Register as a, as a historic place. It's also got all, the whole health center complexes on this campus. So I'm talking the biology. I'm talking the School of Pharmacy, nursing, the School of Dentistry, the med schools on here, the School of Public Health. All of that is on this campus. And then it's got what's known as Superblock. It's this four-block space that has four huge residence halls all on this campus. And then it has the whole athletic complex. So we're talking about the Aquatic Center. We're talking about TCF, which is where they play football, the football stadium, the famous Williams Arena, baseball, tennis, all the athletic centers on there. And then it also has the Alumni Center and, and, a, and it has a center for biomedical research. So all of that is on the East Bank. And then this is all in Minneapolis campus. You got to remember, there's a St. Paul campus and then there's two Minneapolis campuses. And then on the West Bank, this is home to the law school. This is ho home to... Uh, uh, School of Public Affairs, the Carlson School of Management. It's a smaller campus, 53 acres. And then it has all your art and theater stuff. So it's got your Center for Dance, your, your, your School of Music, your concert halls, you know, Learning Abroad Center, and then all the social sciences. And then it has, um, and I told you I had 12 libraries, but Wilson is the largest library, and that's all on the West Bank campus. And then I mentioned before the Washington Bridge connects the two, which is a beautiful walk. Now let's go to the St. Paul's campus. Three miles away, um, this is where you have the College of Food, Agriculture, Natural Resources. This is where you have um, several disciplines in the social sciences. This is where you have the vet school on here. And you just got, it's a different kind of feel there. You've got these flowers, trees, extensive lawns, uh, some farming plots there. It feels more of a retreat from, an, from more, the more urban Minneapolis campus. Um, although, to be honest, even that it is... Um, in the city, it doesn't have an urban vibe when you're on the campus. Yeah. Like, you know that urban vibe, Dave, where you, where you hear those Chicago sirens and everything coming at you? Oh, yeah. Well, we don't call them sirens. We just call them voices of nature. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know how many times I'm recording with Dave. I hear one of those sirens go off. And I'm like, all right, let's edit that out. Or let's just wait until it goes. Like, it's so second nature to Dave. He doesn't even notice them. Yeah, we, we know whether it's the and Berlin sirens or the popo. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And you say, well, what's going on with all these campuses? This has got to be a, a, a hassle to navigate. Well, no, they've got you hooked up there. They've got what's called the campus connector. This bus like literally runs every five minutes during peak times. And in off times, it runs every 20 minutes. So, and they've also got a light rail system. So you've got options between the bus, the light rail and the good old feet using the old feet and getting out and walking in nature. I should also say St. Paul's is home to the College of Design as well. And fun fact, it's right beside Minnesota State Fairgrounds, which hosts the largest state fair in the United States. All right. So let's talk about some of their extremely strong majors, uh, of, of which there are many of them. I'm just going to mention about a, about a dozen just exceptionally strong programs. Obviously, agriculture, that won't surprise anybody. Animal science. I'm going to try really hard to see if I can get one of my vet students to visit and consider it because it's just a fantastic uh, place for, for both animal science and vet school. Architecture, of course, and then engineering. It's a power powerhouse. I try to get it on my engineering students list if they're open to the Midwest because it's just so strong in so many places like agricultural engineering, aerospace, biomedical, electrical, chemical, mechanical. And, and you know, Dave, I'm not a ratings guy, and so I think it's hypocritical for me to say I'm not into ratings and then use ratings, you know, or rankings. Um, but it has all those rankings. If I threw them out there, probably people would be really impressed. It's been multiple people have acknowledged it as a top 50 school in the world. And several of these programs, I'm, you know, I'm okay with rankings in individual majors. It doesn't mean it's a match for you. I just don't like when you try to put the whole sauce together and say this school is number seven. But um, some uh, some of these individual chemical and some of these things and some of these programs have consistently been ranked in the top five in the United States. 
So kinesiology is very strong. Management, math. It's won all kinds of awards for its math department. International business. And Dave, do you know what nurse informatics is? Nurse informatics. I should. I mean, it's daily. I mean, information with the nurses. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so nurse informatics is a specialty that integrates nursing science with analytical sciences to identify, define, manage, and communicate information, data, knowledge, and wisdom in the nursing practice. Wow. And it has been uh, received in many awards as a top nursing informatics program. So there's a little fun fact for people. If you're into combining data science and data analysis with nursing, nursing informatics might be for you. Cool. Clinical psychology, very strong program, computer science, journalism. And then it really does have a strong arts, uh, arts program as well. And then the Carlson School of Management is definitely regarded as one of the strongest programs, especially for international business, entrepreneurial management. And the faculty has won lots of awards for the research and anything. 26 Nobel Prizes, three Pulitzers. And among the alumni, Dave, 25 Rhodes Scholars, seven Marshall Scholars, 20 Truman Scholars, and 127 Fulbrights. Wow. So interesting. They developed what's called the gopher. This is like you trying to claim... Bezos and Amazon and and, and uh, Gore trying to claim the internet. They claimed the gopher was a precursor to the internet. And they developed the gopher on campus. But they actually have developed a lot of different things. Um, Wait, what is a gopher? It's some something related to the internet. They, they claim it was like the precursor before the, the World Wide Web emerged. Oh, I guess. Yeah. So they're trying to basically be an Al Gore and claim the internet. <laughs> That's what I, they're trying to do. They're saying that we actually created the little fuzzy animal. <laughs> yeah. Let's You're like, that's stretching it. When spring comes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they have actually created quite a few inventions within your world, Dave, the medical world. That's right. They, Henry Butchwald invented the infusion pump. Yeah. Uh, Walton Lilhai pioneered open heart surgery. Yeah. You know, and cardiothoracic surgery. Yeah. And a number of researchers uh, developed key pieces of the atomic bomb. Yeah. All right, Dave. Uh, here's quiz time for you. Quiz time, okay. The University of Minnesota alumni include two vice presidents. Who are they? Oh, man, it's got to be Walter Mondale, number Good. one. Good. One? I'm going to say Hubert Humphrey. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Two for two. So two of the famous alumni, two I VPs. Know my, I know my car go first. <laughs> you know third, your politics. The third one, the third you one know was, your politics. My third guess was going to be Punxsutawney Phil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. There is a very, very third famous alum. He yeah. got the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2016. His name? Bob Dylan. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's right. Oh, man, that's right. That's a great alum. There's a lot of other famous alum, but those are probably the three most famous. Hubert Humphrey, Walter Mobdale, Bob Dylan. Now, let's talk about their admission process. So it's pretty unique. So huge focus on your curriculum. They want to see advanced classes. They look at your academic GPA, meaning math, science, social science, you know, English, foreign languages. Um, unlike some of the most selective colleges in the country, you don't have to max out uh, the curriculum and take the most advanced classes in all five of those cores, but they really want to see it in the college in your area that you're interested in. Cause remember you're applying to an individual college and, and I'm going to talk more about that um, in a second. They have different acceptance rates and different admission standards for every one of those eight undergraduate colleges. And so depending on what college you, you apply to, you, you know, it can make, it makes a huge difference whether you're admitted or not. And that's the way a lot of colleges function. That's the way, You'll find that with the UCs. You'll find that with pretty much most of the Big Ten schools, for example. No rec letters, so they don't require rec letters. They have been pretty big on test scores. It's been a pretty big influencer until most recently, of course. And in Minnesota, it's very common for them to have class rank, you know, and in the public schools there. And so class rank is a very, very big part. And this is a little known secret people don't know. A lot of times, even when a school doesn't list class rank, sometimes the counselor still shares that with schools because they can give a, a breakdown of everybody's GPA at times, or they'll just secretly without announcing it to the students kind of let you know sort of where a student is in the class. So they're a big class rank school, big test scores. 
Uh, and then they have these two questions, these 250 word questions that are really important. And so the first one says, include an explanation of why you like to study the majors you've selected. Once again, you're, you, they're admitting by college and by major. So it says, use this space to indicate your interest in other majors. So they want to know why you want to study the major you want to study. You have 150 words. You have to be efficient. Then they have what they call an optional short answer question. But everyone who sort of knows the school says optional doesn't really mean optional. Like they want you to answer it. Don't get lazy. Right. This question says this. The university values diversity broadly defined to include diversity of experiences, perspectives, backgrounds, and talents. Enrolling a diverse community of scholars interested in learning with from each other fosters discussion and discovery in and outside the classroom. Share briefly how you might contribute to or benefit from our community of scholars. 150 words to talk about either the diversity you add or how you'll benefit from the diversity. And by the way, that's a really, really, really common question. So I'm going to give you a bonus, ad a bonus admissions tip. Bonus. Start working on that question right now because you're going to be asked it by one, if you know, by some school, how how you contribute to diversity, and they they define it really broadly, right? They say diversity of ideas, perspectives, so it's not just things like socioeconomics and religion and ethnicity and and race and 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 geography yeah all right one third of students are transfers that come in every year extracurriculars are a big part of their evaluation and they really want depth over breadth most schools are that way they want to see you did a couple things and you went deep with them rather than you tried 15 different things now i'm going to give you their overall um just their act range here but it really once again depends by individual school and college so they're 25th to 75th percentile on the ACT, 27 is the low and 32 is the high. So 75% wow. so of kids have over 27 and 25% of kids have over 32. That's pretty darn good for a state. It's a very selective school. Yeah, it's, wow. it's a, and, and wait till you see individual, some individual schools. It's much higher. Now, it's a, Minnesota's ACT territory. So 91% of kids submit an ACT. Um, once again, they don't discriminate against the, against the SAT, but it's ACT territory. Um, the average student coming in, the average student is in the top 14% of their class. That's the average. Uh, and for some schools, it's way higher than that. Okay, they, they, they have regular admission and they have early action, early action by November 1st, regular. And, you'll, and if you apply, then you, you, you get a decision toward the end of January. And then they have regular admission deadline early January, and you'll find out the end of March. Now, that, as I've mentioned, they're very big on your major. So what you have to do is you have to list your first choice major. And then you get to list an alternative. And they will do everything they can to evaluate you for your first choice. And then if that's not going to work because you're not competitive, they will look at your alternative. But they make it very clear. Don't just put an alternative down and think this is a backdoor way to get in. You get into school and then you transfer transferred to your first choice. Sometimes that happens. But it's not that easy, and you shouldn't expect that you're just going to get in the school and then transfer to your first choice. So if you really would not be willing to go to Minnesota with that alternative choice, then only put a first choice in, and either you get in or you don't get in, because they're very upfront. There's no guarantee we're going to let you transfer once you're in, although they do have a pathway if you're coming in and crushing it. But it's just there's just some hurdles to jump through. Now, you can apply undecided, okay? That's not a problem. In fact, it's the most common way people apply um undecided and then they have a whole entire center called their cape center center for academic planning and exploration that will work with you and study how you're doing once you're there in various courses just to find a, a college that would be suitable for your gifts interests and academic ability um so i don't want to make you think you can't apply undecided some schools like cal poly won't let you apply undecided minnesota that is okay now as far as some other things great restaurants around the campus, not far from downtown. Um, that's one of the huge draws that I was impressed with. You know, when I visit a school, you know, Dave, I try to talk to 20 students. And so that's what I do. I hang out and just start talking to students. And people are so impressed with the restaurants, um, the fact that they can just take the light rail and and be at coffee shops, restaurants, explore the museums, explore the art scene. I mean, you, you're a city guy, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This is cool. That I know you well enough to know you would be very impressed. Yes, uh, yes. It's also a school with lots of rah-rah, 
Like, if you like the rah-rah, I mean, they've got it. Now, this is Minnesota, so hockey's really, really popular. In fact, they, they won four out of ten national women's hockey championships. And the men's teams have a lot of hockey success. But still, football and basketball, I mean, they rock Williams' gym. I mean, they they bring it. I mean, if you like that rah-rah and, and the face painting and getting up for the game, um, I love that stuff. To me, that was the funnest part of college, and I think it adds a lot of balance to academics, and it's good for mental health. Probably one of the biggest gripes I heard from talking to students, and I hear this a lot, by the way, when I talk to students, is one of the biggest gripes, the parking. Students, that's just a common complaint when I talk to students. You know, it's just expensive to create enough parking for 50,000 kids, right? Yeah. So so uh, a lot of times there's a lot of complaints about that. And another thing they complain about is, man, they will hit you up so fast with a ticket if you just park in the wrong place. So like one one person had like seven tickets and in, in, in it wasn't even through the year yet. Yeah, but but in defense of Minnesota, try mm-hmm. parking in Boston. Yeah. Or, or New York. <laughs> I know. Or you might be able to park in Philly, but your car may not be there when you get back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's Chicago. Chicago we taking a too. shot of Philly. <laughs> we taking a shot. And, but this this is cool. They've got a lot of really cool traditions. One tradition is go to TCF Stadium and make a big giant M. That, that's something freshmen do. Another one is to rent out, they rent out the Mall of America, Dave, Yeah. Uh, just for freshmen to just use the amusement park. So they've got a lot of cool things going on there. And um, another thing that I love about their admissions, and I, I didn't know this till I visited, actually. So they have reciprocity, tuition reciprocity with North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin. So that means you get, you know, the in-state tuition rate. Um, they have it for graduate school, too. You don't get the in-state, but for undergrads, you get the in-state rate. Now, it's not automatic. You have to apply for it. But a uh, Wisconsin student, if you're in Wisconsin, you can go to Minnesota and play the in-state tuition. And wow. same for North Dakota, South Dakota. And this is when I knew I was North, Dave. I have it with Manitoba. I'm like, Manitoba? Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they have special tuition perks. But if you look at a map, they border North, South Dakota, Manitoba, and Wisconsin. So they just looked at their borders and said, hey, you live close enough? Come on over here and pay our in-state weight. Um, it's called tuition reciprocity. The other state does it back to them as well. So uh, great restaurant row. And just like another Big Ten st- school that we featured, Bloomington, Indiana, a lot of the action happens on 4th Street. 4th Street is where a lot of the hangout action is. Uh, but what I loved about you to, about Minnesota is that it's a big university, but I really feel they support their students. And, and, and like, for example, they have um, these cultural centers. They have cultural centers. They have, like, cultural centers for American Indian students, for Asian American students, black students, disabled students, Latino students, uh, LGBTQ, you know, um, Indian students. Uh, and there's a large, you know, you know this, Dave, there's a large Muslim population in Minnesota. That's correct. Elian Omar. Yeah. Yeah. So you saw like, you yeah. know, um, I'm so I'm so embarrassed saying this. What's the name of that headpiece people have around their head? What's their name for it? I'm drawing a blank that you know that. Turban? Yeah. Turban. So you saw a lot of turbans, you know, and, it, and I don't know. I just liked it. It just added an element of culture to it. Uh but that, that's all I have before we jump to the stats. Dave, what jumped out the page at you? Well, I, I actually am familiar with Minneapolis. And, you know, I, I want to give a shout out to the whole Midwest. I think there's such a myopia on the coast. They don't realize just how strong all these Midwest schools are. If you go to the Big Ten, they're awesome schools. You they really are. Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, Indiana, Illinois, Urbana. They... Every one of yeah, them. Yeah, you better mention Michigan State and uh, Purdue. Michigan State, Purdue, yeah, I, I, University of Iowa. First of all, no, Northwestern, Maryland. You got it. I mean, first of all, every one of those schools have awesome, like kick butt computer science and science uh, engineering uh, type degrees. I mean, every just, one of them does. Dave, I got to inter- interrupt you for a sec. I'm working with a private client. Yeah. So, and she's very strong. And, uh, it becomes evident that she wants um, engineering and she's from the Midwest and she's like thinking about looking outside the Midwest. And I said, I came back and I said, look, you can look outside the Midwest and I get it that you want to go away, but I'm putting a bunch more of big 10 schools on your list that I want you to look at because for engineering, every one of those big 10 schools is incredible. And I think you mentioned, you know, but here's an example of how big 10 flies under the radar. One of the reasons why I wanted to do that countdown of CEOs Mm -hmm. 
Because I think most people, if we did a survey, don't wouldn't have picked Wisconsin Madison as the winner. Mm-hmm. But if you're in the Midwest, you know that's a absolute powerhouse of a school. Absolutely. And people, but I didn't mean to cut you off. You're on a roll. Well, yeah. I, I mean, people don't realize. First of all, it's a it's it says a lot about a city like Minneapolis, which has grown every single year where people are leaving to, where people love that, in fact, has weather that's worse than Chicago. I mean, there's got to be something about Minneapolis. Well, they have lots of Fortune 500 companies, too, a lot of them there. Well, it's a beautiful city. And and people don't realize that Minnesota, it's, it's what's it called, the region of 10,000 lakes? Yeah, 10,000 lakes. It's a beautiful place to live. And the cost of living, people used to... The, the best investment strategy I ever got was that it's not what you earn. It's the gap. It's the difference between what you earn and what you spend. And when you look at a place like Minneapolis, that's why people move there and stay there, because it's great quality of life. It's beautiful scenery. And when you combine it with a university like Minnesota, just check it out, guys. They They have... And, and Mark is right. I believe on the time survey, it's definitely in the first 50 to 60 best universities in the world. Um, It's got everything you want to offer in terms of majors. It's incredibly expansive. I mean, how many, what you would say, Mark, uh, how many languages was was that? 35. uh, 35. Yeah, over 200 grad school programs, I said. 200 grad schools, yeah. And and more importantly, um, the the fact is is that um, you're in a great city and and a place that you might go from California and go from the Northeast and you might probably live there because you're going to have great job opportunities. Look at my cousin. She goes from Colorado, Littleton, Colorado, where my brother lives, goes to school, graduates, lives there and has no plans on leaving. Well, and, and you know, to that point, think about someone who grew up in Denver. What do they love? They love the outdoors. They love yeah. access to, to a lot of winter sports like skiing and, and, and so forth. Uh, they love uh, great cities, but the cost of living of Minneapolis compared to Denver <laughs> is a factor. <laughs> Maybe of two, you know. Yeah, and I'll tell you another thing that's really nice. You got the skiing and the skating and all that, but those ten thousand lakes are gorgeous. Yeah, is if you like water, there's beautiful you know scenery throughout the whole with the like if you like fishing and boating. You know that. It's so I'm really glad, Dave. You put up. You, you had to represent the Midwest, man. You know, somebody right. needed to stand up. Lisa's always talking about everybody disses the Midwest. Yeah. Well, here's what I'll say. This is what I'll say. The caliber of school that a student can get in at at the Midwest, like you know, I'm working with a lot of students a lot of times, and maybe they're not like 1550 SAT, 3536 ACT, top two percent of their class, but but they're still really strong. Yeah. You know, maybe like they're the top 10% of their class and they're like, you know, 1350 SAT, 29, 31 ACT, good recommendations. They want to go into Boston, you know, their their options are there, but they're more limited, but they could get into some incredible institutions in the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I hate to say it and all of you, those Northeastern people, but the quality of life in a place like Minneapolis is is orders of magnitude greater than the quality of life of the Northeast just because... All right, now you're showing your bias with your Northeast people. That sounded like Ross Pro, you people back in the day. You're going to have... You already took the pot shot at Boston. Okay, it's... it's, it's I know you didn't like living in Boston, Dave, but it's really coming out, man. (laughs) Your your anti-Boston bias is coming out. Boston ain't a city, guys. It's a town. Anytime (laughs) your subways go inbound and outbound, that's a town. (laughs) (laughs) Throwing some shade at Boston there. <laughs> so you know me. I'm all about this individual, right? Some people will love Boston. Some will love New York. I just want people to explore. That's all. Just yeah. explore with an open mind. All right, Dave. Uh, you ready for stats? Gotcha. So I want to talk about their admissions process because, like I said, you're applying to these eight schools. And I'm going to give you their admission stats for each of the eight colleges. I'm going to give them to you in order of the most difficult to get in. So the most difficult to get into is the School of Science and Engineering, which is very common for flagships, by the way. The 25th percentile on the ACT there is a 30. So it's a 30 to 34 is their range um, and a 1370 to a 1490 on the SAT. And in terms of class rank, 
uh, a 12th percent to the second percent. So if you're in the 12th percent in your class, you're in the bottom quarter. And the second percentile would put you at the 75th percentile, which means probably about 25 percent are coming in the top one percent of their class in the School of Science and Engineering. Now, biological sciences is next, 28 through 30, 33, and uh, um, ACT, 1330 to 1460. And from the second percentile to actually the 11th percentile, that's their range. And then nursing is next, 28 to 32, ACT, 1320 to 1440, SAT. Once again, second percentile to the 11th. Do you know what I mean when I say second to 11th, Dave? Is that making sense or is that confusing? Second to 11th. Um... I'm talking about class rank. So what oh, I'm saying oh, yes, is, yes, 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 okay. So, so, if, so the 25th percentile, right. you're the bottom 25 of the class. You're still coming in in the top 11 percent of your class. Right. If you're in the the 75th percentile, you're in top two percent of your class. Yeah. So that's kind of giving you a range of where kids are because in their class rank in their school. Then you have the Carlson School of Management, 28 to 32, 1340 to 1460, second percentile to 13th percentile. College of Liberal Arts, 25 to 30, ACT, 1310 to 1440, sixth percentile to the 24th percentile. So there you may be able to be in the top quarter of the class and still uh, you'd be in the bottom bottom quarter in the Minnesota pool, but you've got a more competitive shot. Food of Agriculture, Natural Resources, 24 to 30, 1300 to 1420, School of Design, 25 to 30, 1280 to 1410, and then Education and Human Development, 22 to 27, ACT, 1280 to 1380. So Little, little less selective there. 52% acceptance rate overall. So about one and two get in. The acceptance rate is 32% for their College of Science and Engineering. Uh, but these are self-selecting institutions. If you're in the city of Minnesota, if you're in the state of Minnesota and you don't have that kind of profile, you just wouldn't apply there. You'd apply to Crookson or one of the other Minnesota campuses, not to the flagship, right? It's the same thing in Penn- in Pennsylvania. Like if you know, if you don't have the goods, you don't apply to Happy Valley. You apply to like Burks or one of the satellite campuses. All right. One thing I love, they've got these three dozen living learning communities, Dave. Yeah. And if and like, for example, if you you want to live with black males, you've got the thing. You can do that. And they have your own little mini HBCU there. And for some people, that's what they need to feel like it's at home. Uh, most of the kids do live off campus. You should know that 22 percent live on campus, 78 percent off. 12% of kids go Greek, 65% from Minnesota. Now, uh, other really, really, really popular states, by far Wisconsin is the next one, right? Over over 40% of the out-of-state students come from Wisconsin because of that tuition reciprocity. And then the next really, really big states are North and South Dakota and California. Of course, the you know the Dakotas have reciprocity, and California is just huge. Uh, racial breakdown, 65.3 white, 12.7 international, 9.2 Asian. Uh, 4.3 black, 4.2 uh, race unknown, and then um, uh, Hispanic, Latino, 3.1, and then 1.2% Native American. And cost of attendance, out of state, 47,000, in state, around 30, um, all in for everything. Final words. Great school. Love the Gophers. I just have to figure out if a Gopher is the same as a Groundhog. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I'm a Midwest guy. I love the Midwest. Uh, well, you're also a city guy, too. And a city guy. And, and you know. Dave I mean, made a secret admission, and I'm going public with it. If he wants me to delete it, I will. <laughs> he said, you know what? I went to Princeton. But if I had to do it all over again, I mean, I had a great time at Princeton. I'm a city guy. I would have probably either gone done Yale in New Haven, yeah. UPenn in Philly, maybe even Columbia, or, or another city school. Yeah, I, I I had to concede that with my daughter because, uh, you know, I I was so excited when I brought her to the campus and this and that, and, and I could just see the distinct lack of enthusiasm. I know <laughs> they had to call me. He needed he might he had I had to take him off the ledge. I visited Princeton, and my daughter has a she's like meh. It's meh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's she's a bright light, big city girl. You know, and she was like. Can we move on to Columbia, please? <laughs> wow, Dave did his whole East Coast trip. And every single school he visited, he called me from Wash U. I love this place. Call me from Emory. I love this place. Was he was great. loving Miami. I love this place. He was loving all of them. Yeah, you know, and, and that's just to get back on it. I mean, sometimes I think we, we you'll hear us toss out a lot of Ivies, but that's just because 
that's a familiarity thing. But I must say that when, Mark, you present these college spotlights with schools like University of Minnesota and Trinity College you did in San Antonio, I got to say that when I actually visit these schools, my reaction is always like, these really are great institutions. And, uh, you know, the sort of take home point is like, don't believe the hype, guys. There's so many great schools out there. And uh, I look back at my alma mater and I think, hey, that was a good school. But if I had to do it again, I could expand that list by a factor of 10 and still be perfectly happy with my choices. Well, another thing that Davis said too. listen, he's got one kid. And so he did some financial preparation ahead of time to put himself in a place to, to, to pay that money. He said, if I had two kids, you think, think I would be, you know, having my kid go to places like Princeton and Yale? No, That's I'd right. be looking at these places like this places. You mentioned a whole bunch of other places where you could uh, go for about 40 grand rather than 80 grand. If you had multiple kids. Or you've mentioned stories of kids who top students who got, into Stanford and then got full rides to Wake Forest. And Correct. and when they had to look at the difference, they'd realize that Wake Forest would get everything that they ever wanted. And they ended up saving their uh, parents a uh, half a million I mean, this is Dr. Years. Lincoln Penny. Okay. Ah, hey, <laughs> so, you know, you know, he'd be going that way. He just had one kid. Yeah, but it ain't Penny. Is a, is a, you should call me Dr. Lincoln a thousand dollar bills or dr lincoln bitcoin because these things are expensive <laughs> yeah dave's like i was like dave are you gonna be going back to the virgin islands because you know he loves the virgin islands but they don't pay that much right yeah. so he's like man i gotta make real money now it's eight grand a month that's right the bills are coming in <laughs> back to life back to reality <laughs> next week in the news high schools are posting their college lists don't be misled, an article by Ron Lieber of the New York Times. Our question from a listener is, what do you predict will happen with wait lists this year? Our interview is part two of three by Courtney Minden, the VP of Enrollment at Babson on the New Ways Colleges Recruit. And our college spotlight comes to you via Lisa, and it is from Appleton, Wisconsin, and it is Lawrence University. See you next week, everybody. Awesome. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website you can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listening app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. We well, have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. David Williams and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer who fixes all of our many errors is Nemanja Modfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Boss. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianas Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it questions at your kid.com by the way check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app our website is your collegeboundkid.com we think of you as our listening family and we look forward to meeting again with you our family next week <laughs> <laughs>